sermon this afternoon deals with the uh, command of the Lord in the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And we have an exposition of this in the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 41. This is page 556 in the Book of Praise. Page 556. We'll read that together. Lord's Day 41, questions and answers 108 and 109. What does the seventh commandment teach us? Again, you shall not commit adultery. Answer, that all unchastity is cursed by God. We must therefore detest it from the heart and live chaste and disciplined lives both within and outside of holy marriage. Does God in this commandment forbid nothing more than adultery and similar shameful sins? Since we, body and soul, are temples of the Holy Spirit, it is God's will that we keep ourselves pure and holy. Therefore, he forbids all unchaste acts, gestures, words, thoughts, desires, and whatever may entice us to unchastity. So far, the reading of our catechism. After the sermon, we will sing in response to the proclamation of God's word, hymn 72, stanzas 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. All the stanzas of hymn 72. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The typical focus of, of this Lord's Day, sermons on the seventh commandment, especially coming out of the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 41, the typical focus is, always seems to have to do with specifically sexual sins. Sins like fornication, adultery, sermons on homosexual lifestyle, how to keep oneself free of, of all of the corruptions of the gift of sexuality that God has, has given us. But we ought to also recognize that very closely connected to, to all of those things is the matter of how we ought to live faithfully as both as marriage partners, as husbands and wives, and as someone without marriage partners, single Christians. And sexuality, sexual activity plays into, into this, but it is not the only matter under discussion. You could say that the matter of sexual life is the central focus of the seventh commandment. We recognize that from what we have just read in Lord's Day 41. That receives a lot of the focus here. And of course it would. And that's because of the nature that we are, are born with. It's the nature that we struggle with all the days of our lives. Our, our sinfulness, our weakness is is very vulnerable with respect to sexual desires and instincts. And because of that, this is one of the most vulnerable, or this is one of the most powerful and effective ways that the devil causes destruction in the church of Jesus Christ. It's often the, the root of Seventh commandment related sins are sexual desires, right? Sexual related sins and the grief that comes because of falling into sexually related sins. And this can also be the most tangible and visible outworking of all of those related problems. And for those reasons, we must certainly 
remain always on guard because of our weaknesses. And so this afternoon, yes, we will be considering the matter of sexual discipline, sexual chastity, sexual temptation, but also a number of the peripheral matters that surround this. The things having to do with how we conduct ourselves well, either as, as husband or as wife, but also as an unmarried person, not only with respect to uh, sexual matters, but also those that are not. In, in both cases, in both cases of the unmarried Christian and the Christian who is a husband or a wife, the goal, the great purpose and command that God gives us is the same. Our lives must be devoted to the Lord. And in both cases, we ought to consider how we are helped through that state, not in spite of that state, but we are helped through that state that God has afforded to us, either as, as married ones or as single ones. God has given us these things for some good reason, for some good thing. We acknowledge that there are challenges that we can anticipate, both as married and unmarried Christians, but we also recognize that whatever our state, all of these things ought to be used in the direction of our service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so our theme for this afternoon, married or single, we live to the Lord. We'll see two aspects of this. Number one, first of all, there are challenges for each. And secondly, devotion to the Lord must be the result of each. So married or single, we live to the Lord. There are challenges of each. But secondly, devotion to the Lord must be the result or the goal, purpose of each. So we're going to spend some time in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7, where the Apostle Paul gives us great insight into the challenges of both. So I want to start, first of all, by looking at 1 Corinthians 7, verses 28. And so these are the challenges, first of all, that face those who are married, Christians who are married. The Apostle Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 28, If you do not marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. And then he, he addresses everyone, uh, husbands and wives, uh, betrothed, um, you know, female, um, fiancés, and, and male as well. He addresses everyone. Those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. I would spare you that. You will have worldly troubles, and I will spare you that. So right away, the Apostle Paul is, is instructing us that as husbands and wives, if you do intend to have a husband or a wife, if you intend to live life as a married person, you will face hardships that come from your relationships with each other. If you did not get married, you would not have those hardships. Why, why can we expect that? Why can we expect certain hardships? Well, it's because husbands and wives, all of us, we are both sinful. A husband is a sinful husband. A wife is a sinful wife. And you put the two together and you have a sinful couple. There are challenges associated with this. You will have troubles. And these are everyday troubles. You will have troubles like agreeing together as husband and wife about how to spend your time. You will have different priorities as men and women. You will consider different things to be the most important. You will have trouble agreeing from time to time about how to spend your money. You will have trouble agreeing about 
what your five-year goals are, what your 10-year goals are. What do we want to get done in the next year? Well, husband, I want to get this done. Wife, I want to get this done. And, and, and there will be some friction um, in all of that. Those are, are run-of-the-mill things that, that couples will encounter all the days of their lives. The Apostle Paul is saying, these are things that consume you, they will hinder you, and you may be spared from this. But additionally, and, and more importantly, somehow, somehow as Christians, you are called to live in a way that is different from what is expected considering the details of your life. I'll say that again. Somehow as Christians, as a married wife or as a married husband, you are called to live in a way that is different or bigger from what is expected considering the details of your life. If you are married, somehow you ought to strive to live as though you weren't. If you're prosperous and, and life is easy, live as though it isn't. These are, these are verses 29 and following. The appointed time is short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. Somehow, somehow, we are called to be able to live without being governed by the difficulties and cares that often accompany married life. He's certainly not saying if you're married, pretend that you're not and, and go do whatever you want. No, of course not. But he's saying the, your devotion to the Lord should be like one who is free of whatever may hinder. I'll read verses 32 through 34 to shed some light on this. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 through 34. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. Like, this is good. We all ought to be anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And then he continues with the inverse. I have a, a very good friend who... communicated to me about the, the anxiety and trepidation that he had about serving as, as an elder in the church. He was enjoying the, the two years off that is customary in reform circles. If someone is an elder, you serve for three years and then you're off limits for two years to recuperate from that. And when those two years were, were running its course and he was anticipating uh, that he would be nominated and elected and appointed and then finally ordained as elder, this is someone who served regularly, he trembled, he trembled um, in anticipation of that. And that is because of the effect that it had on his on his regular life, life with his wife and his, and his children. It certainly affected the lives of his wife and children. The time that it required of him, the way that it drained him of his emotions and left him sort of empty, the chunk that it took out of him because of the, the heavy burdens and the broken heart that, 
that he experienced because he bore the burdens of the people in his charge and wept with them and cared for them and gave everything to them. The sacrifices that were felt by his wife and children, all of it, like this is what Paul is talking about. His interests are divided. I want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but I have this wife, I have a wife, I have, a, I have children, and I have to be a husband to my wife, and I have to be a father to my children. How can I do this and do that at the same time? And I imagine many of you struggle with that in the course of your, of your service as office bearers in the church, and if you're not serving as office bearers in the church, in whatever other capacity you have a heart for, for advancing the kingdom of God, how do you do this while not neglecting the responsibilities that God has also given to you? Paul says it would be good if you who have wives would be able to live and, and, and serve and govern the church and, and lead the church and, and serve the Lord Jesus Christ as though you, you did not have a wife. This does not mean that God is calling all of you elders and deacons to pretend for the next three years or, or until the end of your term that you do not have wives and children to take care of. No. No. These are responsibilities that God has, has given to you. But the fact of the matter is, and this is how Paul begins and ends this section, it is urgent. Time is short. Verse 29, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. And so this is how it would be wonderful if we could all live this way. The present, the, the end of that, verse 31, the end of or the present form of this world is passing away. Time is short. It is urgent. So it would be wonderful if we could all conduct ourselves this way. But we can't. There are eternal lives at stake. So if it is possible, according to the grace that is given each one of you, According to the grace that is given to each one of you, and, and you should desire a great measure of this grace, and that your wife and your children would be given a great measure of this grace to be able to work with all of this, strive to be as effective as someone who is unmarried. Let not the situations of your life, by God's grace, let that not detract from your calling. This is something I am preaching to you and, and to myself especially. Let not the situations of your life, by God's grace, detract from your calling. That's one challenge that we have as married Christians. It's another challenge that the Apostle Paul gives us as well. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. These are verses 8 and 9. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. This is the challenge of, of holiness as respects our sexuality. This is the challenge of chastity. What is chastity? Well, it's the practice of remaining sexually pure. Now, it's not just the act of total abstention of, of sexual activity, celibacy, being completely celibate, but it also applies to those who are married, who have a husband or a wife. Keep yourselves pure both within and outside of 
holy marriage. Seems to me that there's this idea, and it's a pretty destructive idea, that sexual temptation is the strongest for those who, who do not have spouses. And that being married is the magic wand that, that cures that. Right? You ima- I mean, you imagine. A, a, there's a young man, a young woman, who is maybe engaged to be married or, or, or going down that path <clears throat> or, or at the very least desires to, at some point, have a, a husband or a wife. And this young person um, has a very strong sex drive. And maybe in this season of, of singleness, has become addicted to por- pornography, and, and then lives with the hope that, okay, this is only going to be the case while I lack the outlet for these desires that I have in me. And, and of course, once we're married, once I have a, a wife or a husband, then this sexual sin is just going to disappear. I, it won't be a problem anymore. Well, sexual temptation certainly exists outside of the bounds of marriage. And for those of you who are single, this may be something that you are, are struggling with and, and praying to the Lord that, that He would uphold you as you deal with these things. as you're wanting and and waiting for a husband or wife to enjoy this good gift of God that he has has blessed humankind with, but it certainly exists within marriage as well. We are all corrupt in our heart and in our affections, and because of sin, our sexual desires are so often turned away from what is right and what is pure and from what is a good gift to something that is, that is not, to something that is illicit. That's, that's just the nature of sin. Right? In our Lord's Supper form, there's the admonition of self-examination about the seventh commandment. This is not just for those who, who, who don't have husbands or wives yet or who may be in God's counsel who, who, who wouldn't ever, but it says all who either within or outside of holy wedlock do not keep their bodies pure. And we read the same in question and answer 108. We must li- live chaste and disciplined, disciplined lives both within, both within and outside of holy marriage. Satan will use every opportunity to exploit your weaknesses against you. Whatever they are, he'll use whatever he can to derail, to try to derail your life with God. And if this is already an issue for you, if you already are prone to sexual weakness, Satan will try to exploit that all the more, especially as a, as a husband or a wife, and he will try to wreck your marriage. What a, what a proud thing that is for Satan, this union between a husband and wife, this picture of, of Christ and the church. I ripped them apart because of this. And what does that tell you about the union between Christ and his church? Satan will try very hard to try to get himself in there. Or on the other hand, if you have a, a family with, or if, if you have a tendency to whatever the sin is, if you have a tendency to be self-centered, if you have a tendency to be selfish, Satan will try to exploit that all the more to wreck your marriage. If you have a family that has considerable needs, Satan will 
go the other way and try to get you to ignore the other responsibilities that you have in Christ's kingdom so that you neglect the church and you forget about the other gifts and responsibilities that God has given to you. Being married is not a, a first class, it's not a ticket to first class, class Christian life. Even though God certainly has ordained certain blessings through marriage for your life with him. Now, so there are challenges that we are being concerned, or being admonished and instructed about within married life. Now, for the unmarried, there are challenges as well. And they aren't completely different from the challenges that are posed to married Christians. There is the constant challenge of sexual purity. For some, this may be an easier burden to bear. Maybe you do not have, as others may, strong sexual desires that lead you into temptation that others have to deal with daily. But for others, sexual fulfillment is always on the mind. It's always crouching at the door, and, and, and you may yearn for the gift of, of sharing this with someone that God may give to you in His time. What do you do in the meantime? While you wait for God to to give you a husband or a wife, or, 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 or if in God's counsel, this is something that he, he doesn't grant for the whole of your life. Pornography is such a, a powerful, and, and now these days, such a common tool that, let's just call it a weapon, a weapon that is used by Satan that's accessible to, to nearly everyone. What about those who are widows, widowers? Those who throughout their life, maybe for, for, for decades, or, or, or maybe even after just a, a few years of being married, enjoying three or four years of marital bliss and all of the, the rights and responsibilities that go along with that, suddenly are left without it. Suddenly left without their partner. And something that they had enjoyed for, for this time now is, is inaccessible. Does God expect you to completely do without all of those things now. On the one hand, we, of course, might want to give a, an extra measure of understanding to those who either by their very nature have a strong proclivity for sexual expression or, or those who are suddenly widowed and say, well, yeah, of course, this is part of our biology and we have needs and you know what, let's take it easy and, and not be so strict about this. But we know what is true and what is right. Yes, the Lord has created us with, with this gift, this capacity for sexual expression, but He has sanctioned it only within the bounds of marriage. That is the place for its full expression. It's not something that any of us ought to enjoy by ourselves, or it's not something that we take from another person, it's not something that someone owes us, it's not something that we seek to enjoy with, with someone who is not our husband or a wife, but the question is like, does God understand our difficulties in this? Does God understand, really understand the challenge of this? Is he asking too much? And the answer is, of course, he understands. 
I think that's maybe an excuse that we might use. God couldn't understand how hard it is for a human being to be holy, completely holy, to live according to chastity. Does God understand this? Yes, he does. How? How does he understand this? Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He experienced the fullness of human life with all the temptations, with all of the inclinations that we have in in our nature. He took that upon himself to experience all of those things. The Lord Jesus Christ knows how hard it is. He was unmarried all of his life. He carried himself perfectly without sin, without one misstep as we were designed to be able to do. God understands and God provides for us in our moments of temptation, our moments of weakness. He will not leave you without a way of escape. There is no temptation that is unknown or strange. God has given us crosses to bear. He's given us burdens to have on our shoulders. He's given us challenges to face that we must meet while relying upon his grace with confidence that he will uphold us through them. But if we sometimes through weakness fall into sin, we must not despair of God's mercy nor continue in sin. These are very familiar words to us. They're from the form for baptism. If we sometimes through weakness fall into sin, we must not despair of God's mercy nor continue in sin because God has made an eternal covenant with us to be our God and we would be his people. He has given us his son Jesus Christ who was tempted as we are, yet he lived a perfect, righteous, blameless life and his righteousness is yours. However we have sinned, In these regards, the righteousness of Christ that Jesus Christ accomplished, that's your righteousness. It's yours. You are forgiven your sins. You're forgiven your sins. And you are accounted righteous before God through the work of Jesus Christ. We've all in some form or another fallen into temptation, whether in a fleeting moment we've, we had a weak moment of, of, of lust, you looked for one second too long at the, the person you shouldn't have been looking at, your imagination ran away for one second, these things are condemned by Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. If you've looked at someone lustfully, you have committed adultery with them in your heart. Or on the other side, if, if through complete devotion to your husband or wife and your children, you've had your interests divided in such a way that you neglected something else. You neglected either the body of Christ, or the family of God that God has given to us. We are humbled and thankful that God has forgiven us for these sins. But now we ought to recognize We ought to recognize the great blessing of the state of life that God has given to each one of us. We are all in different states of life. Today we're we're thinking about them in two categories, unmarried, married. And we seek to use that state for the advancement of his kingdom and for the benefit of the church. This is something that's very, it's imperative that we consider this. We all form a community of people here. We live together here, whether here in Providence or among the broader church community. 
even in general society. Maybe that's not so strong there anymore, but it always used to be. It's a community or society of people that values greatly being married and having children, having a family. And so it might be the default to think, well, this is what is, is, is normal. This is what you must do. And, and if not, well, then there's something lacking. <coughs> but Paul says something completely different. 1 Corinthians 7, 6 through 8. As a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am. Paul did not have a wife. Paul was not married. Paul did not have a family. And he's saying, yeah, this, is, this is the way that God designed life, and this is how the human race continues generation to generation. Yes, but I wish that all were as I myself am. Paul is saying this would be a good thing. This would be a very good thing if there were a bunch of single people in our midst. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Verse 8, to the unmarried and widows I say that it is good, it is good for them to remain single as I am. It's good if you're able to do this because then your devotion is single-minded. Single-minded devotion. What a blessing you can be to the church. And what good company you keep Saints like the Apostle Paul, Jesus Christ himself, who lived this kind of life. What a role God has given you in his kingdom. The fact of the matter is, the purpose is the same for marriage and for singleness. This must be used somehow in the manner given to you by God, according to the gifts he has given you, according to the grace he has given you in Christ, this must all be used somehow for the edification of the church, for the advancement of the kingdom of Christ. If you are married, then you must cultivate your husband. You must cultivate your wife and your children in such a way that they worship the Lord better and you Worship the Lord better. That's the purpose of your marriage and your family life. It's there for that end. If you are single, then you must cultivate your spiritual siblings, your brothers and sisters in Christ, in such a way that they worship the Lord better, and that by your interactions with them, you worship the Lord better. In each way, we are devoted to the Lord and only the Lord above all else in our bodies and in our souls in all matters. May you as husbands and fathers and mothers do husband, father, mother things in such a way as to build the kingdom of Christ. May you as unmarried Christians do brotherly, sisterly things in such a way as to build the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the same. Give your life to the Lord according to the grace that he has given to you and in a way that is befitting the station and life that God in his wisdom has decided to give to you at least in this season of your life. And trust, trust that, that now you are living precisely the situation that God intends, not only for your personal blessing, for the sake of your eternal life, but also for the advancement of his kingdom. Amen.